I've been thinking quite a bit about conflict these days because I find myself engaged in a number of them. I wind up feeling like so many places I have to go, I have to argue and fight. Maybe perhaps more so than I'm accustomed to. I don't know if it's being back in New York City where we put things right out there. Maybe that's what it is. But there's something where my heart is just in a state of constant conflict. Like I'm having to go places and show up for things that make someone else very, very uncomfortable. And I have to figure out how to make that work. Or I make a proclamation here in church or out on the streets and someone says, you have no business talking about that. Or I try to figure out how to engage with relatives who made different choices than I did in the election. And I wonder, at, in this Christmas season, how do we break bread together? It's been especially difficult for me, then, to figure out how I can be loving through all of this conflict in a world that is deeply divided and dividing even more. Are we called to listen to and to be in spaces where people may be making choices that have nothing to do with our personal thriving? where people are saying, you know, based on how I feel, I don't care about making political choices that threaten your existence. Or based on how angry I am, it's okay for me to put you in harm's way. And in those kinds of spaces of conflict, and it is out of those kinds of spaces of conflict, that I enter into our gospel text today, which tells us a story, if you read beneath the lines or between the lines, of quite a bit of conflict. How could there not be immense, intense conversations between Mary and Joseph? Imagine that. I mean, Patrick and I can have a big fight over who was supposed to clean up the dishes after dinner. But this one was pretty intense. Imagine what it would have been like when she broke the news to him, if she did. Someone did. And we see that Joseph, in the story, had made up his mind about how he would address the situation. But what they don't tell us is how he felt about it. But I can guess, if someone, if my fiancé came to me and said, um, I don't know how to tell you this, but I'm pregnant, how would you feel? Would you cycle through the stages of grief? Would you start off in a place of deep anger and resentment? And might you then go to denial? Or might you walk through a phase of of ignoring it. I would imagine that Joseph did some of this too, as he had to figure out, now how would he handle it? And as news got out, because pregnancies don't stay secret very long, especially in a small little town, and as news started to get out, what were his brethren saying as he walked into the local pub? What did his mom have to say if she was alive? Did she counsel him to do what was his right? which is to have her stoned? Did his friends start to make fun of him, like he's a cuckold with, with no strength or power? And did they all encourage her? We hear stories, remember, of the places where people would get stoned in Scripture. It's like the crowd would start getting mad and excited about it. People showed up for public stonings, like they would show up for a rock concert. This was entertaining. And so maybe all these voices were in Joseph's ear, and he was undoubtedly very, very upset with Mary. Not that it was her fault, of course. This wasn't her choice either. But how could he believe her? And even if he did, he would still have a right to be angry. So, in this space of wondering again about conflict, I wanted to share a word, a 
really helpful word about how we engage the people who cause us harm. And my friend, a theologian named Sean Larson, wrote this. And it's, it's a good quote. The reason people threaten you and find ways to tell you that you're on their turf and try to convince you that your fears and anxieties and tensions don't matter, that you're just like them, isn't because they're stronger than you. Strong people don't bully, and strong people aren't afraid to confront another person's situation. It's best to steer clear of the bullies. It's not your job to save them or to confront them. You've got a life to lead and to protect. Engage them only when you must. Don't spend your life seeking them out, not even to defeat them. But what about the people you love who won't hear you? They invalidate you, they ignore you, or they humor you. They respond by blaming you. They get upset at you for being upset, for daring to introduce your discomfort. How can you respond to them? They will expect shame. They might even invite it. They wouldn't avoid talking about this unless they felt ashamed. Shame says, if I did a bad thing, I'm a bad person. And if they did something to hurt you, the only way they can avoid getting stuck is to avoid hearing about it. And that means avoiding you until and unless you shut up about what feels so uncomfortable to them. But you know you can't be quiet about it. Because when something is important to you, even if you let it go eventually, you can't ever allow it to be invalidated. And that's how shame isolates. Shame always isolates. When you're ashamed, you feel weak and you feel small. You don't want to look someone in the eye. You look down, you cross your arms, you hide. And they probably felt weak and small when they looked the other way while you were threatened. No one looks away from a bully's threats because they feel powerful. And that shame probably goes so deep that they didn't even recognize what they were doing at the time. And it still goes deep enough now that they want you to look the other way and to agree to disagree, to move on, to get over it, all to ease their discomfort about it. The tremendous pressure you feel from them reflects the debilitating pressure they feel inside. But you should reject that choice. You don't have to shame them because the shame is lying. It's true. They made a bad choice. They helped someone to threaten you or they looked the other way and then they claimed not to know what they were doing. And now they're refusing your attempts to confront it, but a bad choice does not make them bad people. They are gifts just like you and so they are still free even now to make themselves right through their decisions. And you don't have to shut up about it either because you matter. Letting yourself go unheard can't be good for you. And it's not what the relationship needs because shame always kills love. Looking askance strangles the honesty and candor on which love feeds. So don't play into that shame. Instead, honor their love. They probably love you more than you know. They don't want to hurt you. How could they? I think about what James Baldwin wrote to his nephew. I have carried your daddy in my arms and on my shoulders, kissed and disciplined him and watched him learn to walk. I don't know if you've known anybody from that far back, if you've loved anybody for that long, first as an infant, then as a child, then as a man. You gain a strange perspective on time and human pain and effort. Other people cannot see what I see whenever I look into your father's face, for behind your father's face, as it is today, are all those other faces which were his. Loving you means that they see all those faces behind your face. And when they see the pain on your face, it scares them to death 
that you might be right. And that breaks their hearts. And powerful emotions like fear and grief are more than a little uncomfortable. They're enough to keep them from looking you in the eye, even though that's what your relationship most needs for them to do. If you love them, you cannot let them get away with avoidance. Courage makes you free. You already know how to suffer long. You see the fear in their response, and you know that the fear isn't there to protect them from you. It's there to honor the fragility of their love, which is easily damaged. What overwhelms them, then, can empower you to suffer with them, to refuse to tolerate what they did or are doing to hurt you, even for an instant. So, I wind up being curious about what allowed Joseph to stick through in the conflict of their marriage and to stay in relationship with Mary and then his adopted son, Jesus. Now, Mary was no bully, but some people in the communities that they faced certainly might have been. But she, too, was in an untenable space, even worse than where Joseph was, since her life and her child's was at stake. And my prayer life, then, gives me a vision for what we might be able to learn in relationship from them in our marriages, in our friendships, in our families. Because maybe they could keep at it, because even beyond the annunciations of angels, or even beyond the pronouncements and the dreams and the sense of should, Mary and Joseph allowed themselves to be real with each other. Maybe Mary never asked Joseph to just be okay with something that he should never have been comfortable with. Maybe Mary acknowledged Joseph's pain and his embarrassment and his frustration and his grief and joined his with her own. Maybe she didn't tell him he couldn't feel like he did. How many times do we tell people how they should feel? I do it all the time. How could you be mad? How could you be upset? You shouldn't be that because I didn't mean for you to feel that way. Mary, maybe Mary didn't do them, those things. And she said she would join him where he was. If she pulled that off, God bless her, because she was about 13 or 14 years old. But together, I guess that they could ask a collective WTF, and if you don't know what that stands for, ask a young person in your life, a big what the heck to God. Because God was asking them some things that were going to be very, very difficult. And the Holy Family didn't need to feel shame or guilt. They were blameless. But they did what they were asked. And God was born in the midst of it. I hear from so many people who wonder what God wants them to do with any situation. And they say, Pastor... This thing is happening in my life, and and I just need to figure out what God wants me to do. And as I listen to the story of the Holy Family, it occurs to me in a new and refreshing way, or clearer relief than I'm used to, that it very well could be that God is going to be asking us to do things that we profoundly do not want to do. Is it clear to you that God might be asking such a thing in your life? to do this thing you're avoiding? Does God want you to stick in a chat space online and provide witness in a face of all kinds of hatred? Is God asking you to break bread at the table with your racist, bigoted aunt at Christmas time? Is God asking, is God making it too hard for you to ignore the calls to show up and show out in resistance to the oppression of your neighbors. Here's my sense. It might not always feel good when we decide to answer God's call, but it will always feel right. And that is what it means to be righteous. Feeling right 
in God's call, even if it doesn't feel so good. And God might be taking you somewhere where you should go, but you don't want to be, and that's okay. God might be inviting you to conversations you've wanted to avoid, but happen to have the only voice that could change a hard heart. Don't go somewhere that'll do you harm, certainly. Following God doesn't mean being bullied, but instead, prayerfully discern how you can go to the places where you have the power to remind people that you bear the image of Christ. You who are gay, you who are transgender, you who are older, you who can't walk without a limp anymore, you who have been broken, you who proclaim a word of power despite the places where people may want to pretend like you shouldn't have it. You might just have the voice that they need to hear and be strong in the Lord and in the Lord take your refuge. In the Lord I take refuge, the psalmist says. Not in our avoidance, not in our dismissal of others who are wrong, but in the Lord I take refuge. For you, O Lord, will keep the needy safe and protect us from the wicked. But that protection doesn't necessarily mean that we won't have conversations with them. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? My bigoted aunt? The guy on the street harassing my Muslim neighbor? Whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? One thing I ask of the Lord, this only do I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Seek out the Lord and go places you never thought you could go. Dwell in the house of the Lord and live amongst people you would never choose to see. Fear no one but the Lord and find yourself infinitely powerful. Find yourself able to reach and influence spaces you never thought could be moved. Even within yourself. For even these dry bones can rise. Even I, even you, even the ones who wait on the Lord shall be satisfied. Amen. And there is nothing that matters, not a single thing that they can take from you ever. So seek the Lord and be prepared for the strength that brings a revolution, that bears the Christ child, that changes the world. Amen? Amen.